morning. Welcome to worship, where we learn to honor the experiences of all people. I invite you to stand as you are able as we join together in confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. Mm -hmm. Holy God. We confess to you of our faults and feelings. To honor and neglect, and do not trust your whole word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than the steward of your creation. We cause her to help you call us to heal. We choose fear and our compassion. Forgive us, we must be us, as we seek to follow the Lord. Hear the good news, God so loved the world that God gave the only Son, so that all we receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy, forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you with the Spirit's power. Amen.
Thank you for hearing to our prayers for Christ and call upon us by your gracious life and death for us and bring light into the darkness of our hearts and anoint us with your spirit for you live and reign in the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated and invite your children to come forward.
A reading from 1 Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him and him over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among the sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Elia and thought, Surely the Lord's anointing is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shama pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went late to Rome. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Live as children of light, 
for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what such people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. So for the second time, 
They called for the man who had been blind. And they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here's an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God is not the sin of sinners, but does listen to one who worships God and obeys God's will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. The religious leaders answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found them, he said, Do you believe in some man? The man answered, and Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. So the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise the Lord. For Pastor Dwayne Steele, some of his earliest memories of going to church with his family include overhearing whispers from nearby pews asking his parents if there's any hope he would ever be able to see. He was born blind and never had any reason to be embarrassed by it. But such questions planted the thought that he was somehow superior, incomplete, or not valuable as he was. It was humiliating and after all talk about him he wasn't there, or like he wasn't a good person. So many people have disabilities of so many types can recall similar moments where questions, comments, attitudes, and scares of others made them feel less than, worthless, incomplete, and humiliating. For those born that way, their sense of self and strength and value is challenged. When others see them as objects that are fixed or talked about, or as pitiable and in need of assistance. For those who have discovered the disability or become that way, such comments and attitudes add another layer of complication to the feeling of loss that some are dealing with. Another obstacle to the growth of strength that has been gained as they come to terms with who they are now. It doesn't help that given many of our religious resources, our stories and our values that speak of all human beings being made in the image of God, Christ's welcome of all people, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit dispersed to everyone, of the baptized having the mission, purpose, and goal to be necessary in the new creation that is coming, often we have way to religious impulses less likely to bring. Great sin and disability. Seeing the devil or demons is involved in the condition. 
viewing them as objects to satisfy our own charitable church achievements. And using the very real experience of blindness, deafness, and so on as metaphors for ignorance and evil under the term spiritual blindness. Even in our gospel reading today, we find elements of these troubling kinds of perspectives. The disciples ask Jesus who sinned that this man was born alive. His voice of the basic human and religious premise that the things that happen to us or the, the way that we are is a result of some good or bad thing done by somebody. Our scientific, secular worldview still hasn't quite chased the superstitious out of us. And we continue that line of faulty reasoning as we look for explanations to why some of the more than some of the Jesus assists the disciples in ridding themselves from that superstitious thinking and rejects that somebody's sinfulness had anything to do with it. But then, but then he offers an explanation of why that many folks with disabilities cringe at it. God has a reason for it. God's works are to be revealed as this man becomes the object of Jesus' healing power. Pinning on God's purpose behind this blindness reduces the man to a mere prop of someone else's production that was neither sent it to nor agreed upon to perform. Jesus mixes the mud and saliva and rubs it on the blind man's eyes. He sends him to the pool of soul, which curiously means sent, where he washes and finds he's able to see. Now this is where the story begins to resonate with the experiences of people who are disabled. The neighbors, the Pharisees, even his own parents, say and do things that minimize his experience of being gifted sight. Just as invisible as he was before he came to see, these ones don't listen to him or believe what he has to say about himself. These ones refuse to come to his defense for fear of speaking up. These ones label him a sinner, although he was once blind and now sees. The schematic that the idea that disability is connected to sin has been dismantled by Jesus, but still, when the formerly blind one gets assertive and attacked and cheeky to the Pharisees, they deem him as more highly sin. Revealing that even when disabled people can function in ways we would declare to be normal, we are tempted to minimize that and devalue them and refer back to the supposed impediment to the blind one. Pastor Dwayne Steele shares that despite so much trouble asking us, this story is powerful for people like him. Because it speaks to these kinds of experiences he has had as, as a blind person. How he and people like him were misbelieved, were not listened to, were not seen as credible agents of their own destinies. He shares of his own difficulty in finding the call as a pastor. Because as marginalized and minority people experience in our church's call processes, it is hard for church people to imagine a leader who doesn't look like them, which usually means who isn't white, male, straight, with two and a half kids, and with full sensory capacities. This story is meaningful because even though the man in the story has his vision of character, those with disabilities connect with the form of the blind man to be treated as a person with lesser worth and value. The story is impactful because the form of the blind man also discovers an agency, courage, calm. 
It is this that Pastor Wayne Steele sees as the point of the whole story. Just like the other disciples and apostles were sent, the blind man is sent. Even before he can see, he is sent. His being sent takes him to the pools of soul where he emerges not only being able to see, but as a person who can testify to the gifts and grace of God. This experience puts him right in the midst of his community members and religious establishment with a message to share. He doesn't quite know who did this for him or how, but he knows it happened and he witnessed to it. When pressed for more details, then he knows out of their disbelief, distrust, disrespect. He pushes back with sarcasm and wit in a way that reveals the false judgment of the Pharisees. We remember also that this man was a beggar. And so like those disciples who were fishermen, tax collectors, the formerly blind man receives a change of vocation, a calling to the person who proclaims the wonders of God. Those in the disabled community find in this story that whether or not they can hear or see or walk, they are sent ones, called ones, courageous ones who can be the presence that challenges others and uncovers the judgments of others, who can in their own way testify to the truth as they know it, understanding that the entirety of who they are is a gift to the church and to the world. They already know full well their own limitations, which means that they are a lot further along in their world as human beings than many of us are who have a hard time thinking of ourselves as limited in anything. This story, our gospel story, combined with the experience of folks like Pastor Wayne, teaches us to pay attention to the perspectives of those who are known or seen as disabled. They hear the stories of faith in a way you would not have to imagine. They can sense problematic interpretations we may have always taken for granted as the proper ones. More than that, they are witnesses, siblings, sent alongside those of us who can't hear or see or walk, to testify to the goodness and grace of God. So when we create space in our community so that it is a place of welcome, when we strive to become people who honors each and every person as gifted with a story to tell, and not as a sinner or a repair project or as incomplete, then we find that we are living more deeply into the kind of people God is calling us to be sent, gifted, courageous. Then we begin to become a bit more like Jesus who goes to all of those driven out for any reason. Anyone pushed to the margins, forgotten, ignored, looked over, and disbelieved. Even those who put on crosses to humiliate and eliminate them. He finds work in the ones who have been relegated to the sidelines or buried in the tombs, and goes to be with them to validate their existence with no one else will, to call and send them with a message to share and a mission to fulfill. In this Lenten season, may we learn to listen and learn from those in communities that are often overlooked or undervalued. Their experiences will show us something new about what Jesus is up to in the world. Their identity as beloved of God as they are. Their partnership in the work of God as witnesses. The community that we are becoming that honors the wickedness of all. Is creating the world. Is leading them through a time of doubt, sorrow, and rejection. 
to God's kingdom of life, justice, welcome, and peace. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. Eternal God, you seal us by the Holy Spirit and mark us with the cross of Christ forever in baptism. Inspire us by your love as together we strive for justice and peace in all the earth. Gift future leaders of the church with vision and courage, especially Barbara Sanderson, now in his final year of seminary. Merciful God, Create God, by your word you have made all things, and you made nothing you have made. Teach us to perceive the beauty of the breadth of your creation, from the grandest mountain range to the smallest springtime bud. Give relief and rescue to those experiencing natural disaster, especially Syria and Turkey. Merciful God. Powerful God, you anoint kings and establish rulers. Guide the work of heads of state and elected officials. Encourage them to lead with justice and to remove barriers that impede the well-being of all. Guide the nations of the world, especially Russia, Ukraine, and the Holy Land, into peace. Curb our thirst for power and violence that leads to mass shootings and armed conflict. Merciful God, shepherding God, you lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. Keep watch over those who weep. Tend all who are sick and comfort those who grieve. We pray especially for Kathleen Edwards, Marsha Pearson, Paul Anderson, Tim Bell, Migrant Children, Jamie DeSimone, Chuck Havoc, those who are persecuted for their gender or sexual identity, victims of police violence and their families, Anna Kovacek, Patty Pearson, Wade Campbell, John Lee, Roger Erickson, Philip Hedges, Sonny Holding, Gary Williams, Norma Wittig, Gary Roper, Gary Boyd of Birdseye Erickson, and those we name in our hearts. Give them your living waters always. Merciful God. God our host, you fill us at the table with more than we could ever ask. Feed us with hunger for justice. Equip the feeding ministries of this congregation and, and community, especially Chum. Nourish us so we can nourish our neighbors. Merciful God. God of history, with thanksgiving we remember our ancestors in faith who cared for your people, especially Joseph, guardian of Jesus. We praise you for the ways they formed the faith of others and continue to inspire us. Merciful God. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Maybe see the A few announcements to share with you this day. A reminder that our Lenten Wednesday time together is at 6 o'clock on Wednesday. We create the goal community for sharing food, conversation, and activity, and worship. It's at 6 o'clock on Wednesday. 
Also, if you notice, uh, that you can see in our bulletin, we've shown and we've been sort of food shared campaign, a uh, variety of needs that are uh, apparent in our community. Anything more we should know from Chung? Um, we need everything. <laughs> um, it's, it's just incredible the number of people that we receive that come to us on Wednesdays from the whole thing um, downtown and even on Monday. And there's so many people that um, we do really get to turn around because we just we can't. There isn't enough. Um, good thing, positive thing, no. Because it's food for month, we have received a few donations, um, which is great. One thing that we do ask when you do donate, please do not donate um, expired food. Um, we had uh, the Boy Scouts did a drive at Super One, just a quick little story. Um, and someone brought in like boxes and boxes of food. And when we got it, everything was old. It was like somebody had cleaned up. And so what we have to do then is we just have to throw it out because, um, you know, there's no, we don't want to share that with any of the uh, people at home. So um, that's the only thing. And uh, keep up the good work every week when I do bring uh, food down. Right now I am keeping it out there because it's a challenge between um, as a church and um, Afterwards, we can all wish Mike Edwards a happy birthday, too. <laughs> oh, that would be a great thing to do.
that we should all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and Merciful God, for our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the past of peace, and renew it again for baptism that we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so, with all the choirs and angels of the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name.
Father, 